Well, say a few more, a few things about some of the other Conrad books on the list. Under Western Eyes was a financial failure when it was first published in 1911. And I think it's still one of his least read novels. How many of you have read it? Well, that's, that's pretty good. The background is revolution, bomb-throwing terrorists, and double agents. To what extent uh, these people were news at that time, I just don't know. See, the media was really in its infancy at that point. But at any rate, it apparently it wasn't a popular current subject. At the present time, when terrorism is again in vogue, very much so, uh, the book might have uh, quite a lot to say to present-day audiences. And also, this, you notice that these are the Tsar's uh, secret police are just exactly reminiscent of the KGB. It's like, you know, they just same guys stayed in there with different management. Not all that different. And the basic theme is, again, corruption of an ordinary person under stress. That's a reoccurring theme with Conrad. You see, you have Razumov, uh, who's the uh, protagonist of Under Western Eyes, Nostromo, uh, Jim, uh, Will Elms in An Outcast of the Islands, and, of course, Elmar didn't need to be corrupted. He was already completely a complete jit. <clears throat> Uh, in Conrad's own words, Razumov is an ordinary young man with a healthy capacity for work and sane ambitions. He is working towards an academic career. In 30 years, he could be a respected professor. Then Conrad drafts this rather dull, rather stodgy young man into his novel. All Conrad's characters seem to be unwillingly enlisted in the cause of fiction. And no wonder, because that means trouble. No trouble, no story. And they would dodge the draft if they could. But the notice always arrives in some unexpected guise, report to casting. Now this Halden, a bomb-throwing terrorist who has just executed, as he says, Mr. P., uh, takes refuge in Razumov's apartment under the totally mistaken impression that Razumov sympathizes with the revolution. Uh, and he is utterly appalled by Heldon's presence in his room. It's like having Patty Hearst dumped into your lap. But one hell of a lot worse, because this is Tsarist Russia with police quite as brutal and arbitrary as the present-day Russian police. And this isn't a few years in a comfortable jail with a publisher's contract coming up. Uh, this is 10 years in Siberia, considering the uh, seriousness of this uh, case, might even be a death penalty. So all he wants is to get Halden out of his room. But Halden sends him to a connection who is supposed to arrange his escape, but the connection is dead drunk. And there's a great scene when uh, Razumov loses his temper and breaks his club over this guy's head. Doesn't help any. Uh, so then uh, Razumov is wandering around in the snow, and he has already decided to turn Halden in. He was thinking about the, um, there's some very good, uh, what I would call hallucinations, go on, hallucinations of stress. Here. And this uh, Conrad does very, uh, very well indeed. So he's already decided to turn Halden in, and then he thinks about um, uh, the, uh, you know, he's just been to try to arrange Halden's escape, and then he thinks, well, I better not say anything about that. It was just like a, uh, he says, a, a very hard faucet turned over in his mind, and he better not say a, a word about that. Uh, he's wandering around in the snow, and then uh, he has this hallucination of seeing Halden, Halden's phantom stretched out in front of him in the snow. Anyway, he goes to his patron. This is a prince who's been sort of uh, his patron, and there's a hint that um, Razumov may be the... I'm thinking that this is carrying the unit, isn't it all? Um, there is a, a suggestion that the prince is um, 
uh, that uh, Razumov is the illegitimate son of the prince. Well, anyway, he goes to this uh, prince, and the prince, of course, goes to the police, that is, to the military. And uh, like Lord Jim, you see, uh, Razumov has taken an irretrievable step. He has become an informer. There's a very good scene when uh, Haldin walks out of his apartment. This is another of these hallucinations of stress, and he sees, um, he knows the police are waiting out there, and he sees the police as uh, sort of someone with a cape, with a black cape uh, around and a, and a slouch hat. And then another picture, as he says, uh, perhaps just a shifty-eyed scoundrel with a, lo with a loaded stick uh, smelling of raw onions and spirits. Well, uh, well, of course, they, the authorities are not convinced. They think that there's some connection, and they're quite right in thinking that. Uh, remember, he has something to hide, namely the fact that he did try to facilitate Halden's escape to get rid of him. And he's expecting to go up against the tough cop, that's the general that he saw at first, and instead he goes before a con cop, a counselor, McCoolin. And that, uh, the interview with Counselor McCoolin is uh, a very fine indeed. It's one of my uh, favorite passages. Um, I wish I had the book here. I tried to buy it, but I can't find it in town. But there's one point Razumov is about to walk out. He says, I protest against this comedy of persecution, a comedy of errors, phantoms, and suspicions. I shall take the liberty to retire, simply to retire. He walked to the door. An unhurried voice said, Kirillo Sidorovich. Razumov at the door turned his head. To retire, he repeated. Where to? asked Councillor McCoolin softly. He's not about to let this guy go, of course. Um, well, anyway, I'm, I'm frequently asked what other writers have influenced my own work, and I would say without hesitation I've been most influenced by Joseph Conrad and Denton Welch. The interview between Carl and Dr. Benway in Naked Lunch was quite consciously modeled on the interview between Councillor McCoolin and Razumov, and they both have the same trick of half-finished sentences, um, and the end is almost identical. That was quite, quite consciously did that. And years later, when Brian Geisen was writing the process, he showed me a passage of dialogue taken verbatim from a science fiction novel and used in a similar scene in his own work in progress. Uh, the science fiction novel appropriately concerned a mad scientist who devised a black hole into which he disappeared. And this passage, was, not, however, was not used in the uh, published text to the process. Oh, uh, incidentally, I think Under Western Eyes is definitely good film material. You see, uh, Razumov, the informer, falls then in love with the sister of Haldin, who was executed, uh, was uh, arrested and executed after being turned in by Razumov. And then Razumov has been enlisted by Councillor McCoolin as an informer in Geneva which was then a center of terrorist activity. There's a lot of comic scenes in Geneva, actually, in the salon of this uh, lady who receives all these terrorists. And uh, there's also, could have a very good ending. You see, Razumov has been deafened by a terrorist. They find out that he is an informer. And his eardrums ruptured, so he's stone deaf. Now, I see the film. When this happens, she could turn off the soundtrack. There's snow, and he's walking around in the snow. Uh, and you repeat here the scene of his wandering around in the snow when he sees the Phantom of Haldron across his track. The tram is coming, and of course, he, uh, the guy's going like this, you know, banging on the bell. And of course, uh, Razum, um, Razumov can't hear him, and the tram runs into him. In the novel, he survives that and lives on, but I think in the, as, as a film, it would be much better if that was, uh, if he was killed right then. Well, now, we're turning from heroes, although Razumov is hardly a hero, uh, 
to anti-heroes and consider the picaresque novel. Now, the picaresque novel is is uh, inseparable from the concept of the anti-hero. Um, and actually, the first one of the first novels uh, ever written, or one of the first novels that we have, is a picaresque novel, and that is the satiric and uh, Petronius Arbiter, who was a uh, courtier at uh, Nero's court, if you remember. How many of you have read that? I can't really see very well. Many of you read the satiric and... It's, uh-huh. it's very funny, actually. And it's sort of very modern. And uh, there's a great, great scene in there is the Feast of Trimalchio, where uh, this um, rich freedman, Trimalchio, is getting drunk and asking everyone to mourn for him as if he was already dead and reading his will and... It's the, uh, the, not the hero, but the protagonist is a thief, cheap thief, and an adventurer living very precariously by his wits. And uh, then there's another novel, an early example is The Unfortunate Traveler by Thomas Nash, which was written in the 16th century. And the hero, Jack Wilton, is uh, a typical picaresque anti hero. Uh, he the, he uh, encounters a series of adventures and misadventures, often of a comic nature. And most picaresque novels are funny, um, and most of them, they all have anti-heroes, and the, uh, the typical hero protagonist of a picaresque novel is also, um, well, he's not a member of the establishment, he's an outsider by his nature. So, uh, now, I was thinking of three writers who really, to my uh, way of thinking, come under the, or uh, um, are in the Picaresque tradition, but are not generally considered so. And those are Jane Bowles, uh, Celine, and Denton Welch. And I think I'm also myself very much in the Picaresque tradition. Uh, and actually, Celine's Journey at the End of the Night is a classical picaresque novel, but was not recognized as such by the critics. They all said, oh, this cry of despair and all that. It's, it isn't at all. It's a terribly funny book. Uh, Jane Bowles and Denton Welch also, to my mind, fall into this category. They're not uh, as directly or not as, they're not in such a classical picaresque tradition. But both writers pleasantly surprise the reader with frank admissions of ineffectuality and cowardice. And the anti-hero is also very much a punk phenomenon. And not for nothing was Welch called, uh, Denton Welch called punky by his father. Uh, when the gap between what one has been taught he should feel, think, say, and do, and what one actually does feel and think becomes too great, the anti-hero emerges. He emerges from a black hole, a vacuum in the fabric of correct behavior, and his conduct is often so outrageous as to provoke laughter rather than censure. Uh, I've also made a collection of, of anti-heroes in reality from newspaper accounts. There was actually a pilot in the early days of aviation who'd smuggled a parachute on board, and he bailed out and left the passengers to crash. <laughs> and... Uh, in the sinking of the Titanic, there was a steward who uh, got himself up in women's clothes and switched into the first lifeboat. And he was discovered. How he ever escaped with his life, I don't know. But he did. And then uh, I used that in um, Twilight's Last Deeming and I had the captain escaping in women's clothes. And then there was a Mexican bus driver. This is really the prize of the collection. And the bus was completely full, about 47 people in the bus, and a lot of people on top of the bus, the way it happens in Mexican buses. And uh, the bus driver is smoking a cigarette with a leaky can of gasoline beside him, and, you know, singing idiot mambo, K okay, Rico mambo. He looked down and saw that the, uh, the gasoline had ignited from his cigarette. Without interrupting his song, he opens the door and jumps out. So the plane went ahead and crashed into a ravine. Everybody inside was burned to death. And about 30 peons riding on the roof 
uh, jumped off, you know, 30 guys with machetes. And they turned and looked at the driver, man, and he took off and has never been seen since. He outdistanced 30 machetes. <laughs> and those, those mountain boys, you know, they can run. So he must have been a real marathon runner. Well, actually, actually true, yes. They never found, never heard of him again. Now, uh, Celine, I just uh, speak of one scene, which I think is terribly funny, the scene on the boat. He gets on his boat going to Africa, and all the other passengers are civil servants and army personnel. So they're, they're on a, they don't pay, see. But when they find out he's paying, paying his own fare, they decide there must be something all wrong about him. He is suspected of pimping a bit and selling cocaine, also a pederasty, but that only is a sideline. So finally they corner him on the deck, and they're prepared to beat him to a pulp. So... He rushes up, seizes both the captain's hands in his with a fine show of emotion, and says, Among soldiers and gentlemen, should any misunderstanding be allowed to exist? In God's name, vive la France! So, he says, however ill disposed, it is very difficult for an officer to strike a civilian in public. However ill disposed towards him, he may feel just when the other is shouting, vive la France! So he says, their hesitation saved me. Bit by bit, while this humiliating trial lasted, I felt my self-respect slipping away from me further and further, and at last completely gone, as it were, officially removed. Say what you like, it's a very pleasant sensation. After this incident, I've always felt infinitely free and light, morally, I mean, of course. Perhaps fear is what you need most often in life to get you out of a hole. Personally, since that day, I have never myself wanted any other weapon or any other virtues. This is about as far as you can get from Lord Jim. And then he goes into the bar with him, and they start telling all their stories and war reminiscences, and he says, that's something that deserves to go down in history. And then they begin to feel, oh, he's a very nice guy. There's some great... Uh, passages in Africa itself. Uh, let's read one here. Uh, endless petty quarrels, both personal between groups, were always in progress, between the military and the civil servants, between these and the traders, and between both of them against the former, and then between all three against the black man, and finally between the black men themselves. Such vital energy as was not sat by malaria, thirst, and the heat of the sun was consumed by hatred so bitter and insistent that many of the residents used to die in their tracks, poisoned by themselves like scorpions. <laughs> very, very funny book. And, uh, Death on the Installment Plan is also, I think, very funny indeed. I sort of lost him in his later book. Now, uh, Denton Welch, very different uh, type of writer. I often recommend uh, Denton Welch to young writers who say they don't have anything to write about because he can go to a tea party or go out and buy a snuff box or something and get a whole chapter. So I'm just going to read a few selections from A Maiden Voyage and A Voice uh, from a Cloud to give you some idea. In school that afternoon, we each had to write a chapter of a ghost story. This is the only lesson I've ever enjoyed or remembered. Borrowing from the Bible I wrote, the hair on my flesh stood up. How everyone laughed when it was read out. I described the red damask walls, the silver sconces, and the great bed crowned with moldy ostrich feathers. All very romantic. And now he's in China. I slept alone that night in a bungalow some way from the others. Its owner became very ill and had been taken to Shanghai, and no one expected him to live. Two soldiers were put to guard me. Um, I began to explore the rooms. A ghostly smell of liquor hung about the sideboard in the dining room, and the dried sediment in the empty decanters reminded me of scabs on sores. I sat down in the armchair, which let out a dirty sigh of dust and tobacco smoke. 
I was fascinated by the shop-soiled feeling in the house. I went to look at the bed. From the ceiling, a gray cataract of mosquito net fell around it, giving it an important, grim look. And then uh, he finds one of the soldiers looking in the window at him. At breakfast the next morning, we had buffalo milk on our porridge. I tried not to imagine it squirting from tingling, leathery udders. It reminded me of the soft, rich mud around a pool where cattle go to drink. And this is a passage I like very much. They're sort of the, uh, they're put off their train by soldiers, and they just uh, stop in this hotel in some small Chinese city. A wasted-looking servant came out of the rooms and led us up the brass-bound stairs to another wide passage. Here the reek of opium was unmistakable. It hung heavy and sickly in air which was already loaded with smells of garlic and sweat. The most disgusting smell of all was the breath of scent, which floated corruptly on the back of the others like a top dressing. Um, Sleeping people lay on the benches. One had just woken up and been sick. His vomit lay in a pile beside him. A door opened and two Chinese youths ran out. They were dressed only in European shirts. As they darted past, I saw with a shock that one of them wore a little ebony and ivory crucifix, which bobbed stupidly up and down on his chest. The weary servant took no notice. I lay down on the bed again and waited for the dawn. It came in a little thread, like an inflamed eyelid against a gray face. The morning seemed dead and old and tired before it had begun. The life in the passage revived. There was vomiting and retching and the noise of servants quarreling. This is a passage I like very much. Uh, you know, children are supposed to love their ponies. Uh, and then he's in... Um, he's in um, China, and some girl asked him, would you like to come riding this afternoon? Someone has lent me a pony, and I thought you could hire one and come with me. I had not ridden since I was ten years old, when my horrible little black pony had at last been given away. How I had hated it. Once it had broken out of the stable and galloped through the roses and over the lawn, showing its awful yellow teeth. Now this uh, passage here is the beginning of a voice uh, through a cloud. Uh, reading from the forward here, the manuscript of this nearly completed novel by Danton Welch was at his bedside when he died at the age of 31. He had suffered 13 years of chronic and painful illness caused by a road accident in which he sustained a serious fracture of the spine. He was just riding along the road, and some female motorist uh, came along and ran into the back of his bike. Uh, he was a, an invalid from then on out, and this a book, A Voice to a Cloud, describes his uh, hospital experiences. But what is very interesting, I mentioned the walk exercise in the last, exercise, in the last um, class, where you just notice um, things as, as you walk or ride on a bicycle, it wouldn't make any difference or whatever, and also paying attention to what you were thinking and feeling at a given time when you saw something or whatever. Now, he is doing this in the uh, time just before the accident. So everything is very important, you see. Just if he'd been... Uh, stayed a little longer in the church or not so long in the um, snack place, uh, it wouldn't have happened. So it gets, uh, it really is quite a charge. I remind, reminded, how many of you saw the Battle of, of Algiers? Uh, it was a bad title. It sounded like the Riff or something like that. But it, actually it was uh, about the, um, of course, the, the French in Algiers. And uh, particularly uh, effective were the uh, bombs. You got a bomb in a milk bar, for example, and the audience knows the bomb's going to go off and the other people don't. And it really is very, very tense, you know, just minute after minute after minute getting closer to that bomb. And that's, you get some of that feeling 
from this um, passage. He goes into a church and he doesn't stay long. He feels rather embarrassed. And then, uh, so I was not used to traffic. So near Beckenham, I saw teas and light refreshments advertised. And he decides to go in and have a coffee. The drive led me at last to the front of a small 18th century house with a portico of ionic columns rising to the height of two stories. And uh, he goes in, and this uh, 18th century room, as it says, was spoilt by um, glossy plaques advertising swept soda water and player cigarettes. And he was the only one there. I sat down at one of the little tables and ordered coffee and biscuits. As I waited, I looked out the windows at the little figures moving against the bright green and pale pink of the bunkers. It was, it's by a golf course. Now here's an uh, interesting passage. Looking at the sides of the windows, I saw that some of the beautiful little brass handles on the shutters were broken or missing. I was given a vague, uneasy feeling of universal damage and loss. The waitress brought my coffee, then retired behind the counter again and began to laugh and talk quietly with her companion. I wondered if she was laughing at me, but her voice was so low I could hear nothing. Well, anyway, he lingered here quite a long time. And this is very crucial, of course. At last, I got up to go. I gave the room a final look. I then recrossed the galleried hall and passed out beneath the portico. My head was full of plans for restoring the house. I was ruthlessly sweeping away the waitresses, the lace parchment, lampshades, the wicker furniture, and the food counter. He gets out on the, the uh, road. I thought that the ride had been very easy and pleasant so far. I felt I'd wasted many opportunities by leaving my bicycle in the country and not bringing it to London before. I was going along a straight, wide road, keeping close to the curb, not looking behind or bothering about the traffic at all. I heard a voice through a great cloud of agony and sickness. This is when after he's been hit and, and he's um, uh, practically unconscious, and then a cop comes up and so on, taken to the hospital. And uh, as I say, he never recovered. And also, but... Uh, he had been a painter and was going to uh, art school and um, he didn't really start to write until after the, after the accident. And this, which was about the accident, was the last novel he wrote. The first was um, uh, the first was made in Voyage. Well now, I, uh, I don't have Jane Bowles' book with me, so I'll talk something, say something about her on Monday, uh, and just mention here that she was a, a legend in her own uh, life. She spoke perfect Arabic with a, a heavy Bronx accent, and um, Brian told me about how she, she was up on the roof. You know, only the women are allowed on the roofs during the daytime in, a, in an Arab town. You go up on the roof, and the women will all start screaming at you. Pardon? Uh, she was up on a roof. The, all these Arab ho houses have flat roofs. The men are not supposed to be up there until sundown. And if they get up there in the daytime, that's when the women are, you know, hanging out to wash and gabbing and gossiping. Uh, and uh, they'll start screaming at you. Um, so she just leaned across to the next roof and she said, you had anything good to eat lately? And she was in solid... And she had all sorts of mischances in her personal life. She had a manuscript completed, and a great wind came in. This blew the manuscript out of the room and away and was never seen again. She didn't have a copy. Uh, she had a stroke and eventually became insane, and she died in a hospital in Malaga about um, two or three years ago. I'll have her book. It's, uh, it's been reissued. The complete works of Jane Bowles. She didn't write all that much. It can all be gotten into one volume. And it's um, been reissued by Echo Press called My Sister's Hand in Mine. Great. The, uh, I think that 
Two Serious Ladies is also a really a comic classic. There's some marvelously funny scenes in there. Uh, in 1959, Brian Geisen said that writing is 50 years behind painting and applied the montage technique to writing. Now, how did uh, painting get 50 years ahead of writing? Well, most forward steps in any field occur through necessity. It seems that the natives of this planet will not get up off their ass until they have to. Now, the most important advances in medicine in the past century have resulted from wars. That's... Uh, you know, they, they didn't lick malaria until World War II. And evolution, of course, is also a matter of, of necessity. Who knows, the future on this planet may belong to creatures who thrive on radioactivity. <laughs> they certainly have a powerful lobby, I must say. Well, a hundred years ago, here are all these painters peacefully painting cows in the grass. And everyone says, my, how clever, it looks just like cows in the grass. You can almost smell it. And they bought these canvases for huge prices. The Vanderbilts had a load of this crap for which they had shelled out millions. And the collection sold at auction for about $100,000. You see, the paintings return, retain a certain value as antiquities rather like wooden Indians. But the prices, uh, the, the, you can't get anywhere near the price that these things sold for. Uh, so what happened to this painter's paradise? Photography, click. A camera can do it better. And uh, photographers shot the cows and the grass out from under painters, and they had to move on. And then there was montage, impressionism, minimal impressionism, body art, happenings. And every artist practically now is his own school. One guy's doing broken plywood and something else. And so uh, now let us ask what invention could blast the writer out of sequential narrative? Uh, well, perhaps a tape recorder sensitive enough to record subvocal speech. You see, here's the intuitive writer cleverly approximating the verbal stream of consciousness. Why, it's so real just what such a person would be saying to him or herself. Click, turn on the recorder, click, play back. The tape recorder can do it better. So now writing has to move. And uh, the process... I would say anticipates uh, such an invention, and the writer is disappearing into his tape recorder. Uh, the process is certainly a neglected book. Few books have sold fewer copies and have been more enthusiastically read by those who did read it. The process was originally published by Doubleday, but one of the directors, I recall, hated the book, so there was no promotion, and the, cop and the copies were finally uh, pulped. And Cape was the publisher in England, and it's still in print, I think, in the Panther paperback, if you can find it. Well, anyway, in the process, Brian Geisen eliminates the omniscient author who knows the past, present, and future, and the innermost thoughts and feelings of his characters. Nothing is presented in the process that the person speaking could not know from his own experience. The process is a series of first-person recordings, and the tapes are I, thou, he, it, she, we, you, feminine, you, masculine, and lastly, they. And all the narrations are recordings on the ewer of Ulysses O. Hansen, a pot-smoking black professor, recording and recorded as he travels through great deserts where the fabulous Heimers juggle precarious phantom empires over heat waves and atomic testing sites. And the tape recorder is the point of observation that brings each uh, narration into present time. Uh, rising a curtain can begin with a tape recorder against a white wall. There's a round opening in the wall through which, like a porthole, we see the blue sky of Africa. A black hand presses the button. Playback one. Um, I'm out in the Sahara heading due south with each day of travel less sure of just who I am, where I am going, or why. This desert is so long it can take a lifetime to go from one end to the other and a childhood to cross at its narrowest point. Sand dunes, a jolting truck, smell of hot iron and acid exhaust fumes. Hansen fills his keep pipe. Black greaser, the driver's assistant, 
on a flute made out of an old bicycle pump is playing a windy tune. Scenes rise from the quarter. Here's a fort from Beau Jest. Um, that's the eye. And now is uh, Hamry, uh, who comes to the mountain village of Jujuka, where the rites of Pan are still celebrated. And he had been... Um, he had been um, the goat god at one time. The, a boy is sold into a goat skin, and he is uh, Bijelud, the goat god, for the festival, which lasts about four days. Um, and he is not at all content to be just a recording. And uh, now the master of ceremonies, uh, Hassan Merikani, the black professor, introduces that interplanetary vaudeville team, the Himmers. This pair who traveled through Africa with a million dollars tossed casually into a suitcase, leaving a wake of riots and devastation behind them, as all travelers in present time must do, riding a surfboard on the wave of present time, which is, of course, what the city desk calls news. And remember that all news is bad news. Now the one and only Thay Hema, doctor of grammatology, advanced student of MSAC, hereditary bishop of the Far Isles. Now, of course, um, grammatology is actually Scientology, and the Hemmers are actual characters who consider themselves to be the power behind Hubbard. And they were called the Skeltons, and a witty uh, local CIA man said, Old Mother Hubbard went to the cupboard and found a skeleton there. <clears throat> so uh, this is Thay Hemmer. He said, I've been through the whole gamut from Budo, voodoo to MRA, from Scientology to Spood, and every branch of Eastern mysticism. And I say to you, proclaim to you one and all, that Morocco is the wild west of the spirit. hi -o, silver. And he throws himself into self-flagellation cults with considerable personal danger. And he is a dauntless initiate, a big-time player in the game, an interplanetary agent, shimmering with eerie authority from some tenuous lost place far away and long ago, or if you like, the high priest of some future cult clothed in robes of perhaps. You begin to see I am just a recording, he said. Well, this is Operation Seal. And this emerald seal, uh, which he describes as the beginning end of word, he uh, gives to the black professor. Uh, and actually there was such a seal, and he did give it to Brian, and we finally hocked it in London, didn't get very much for it. Uh, but the seal is supposed to be the beginning and end of word, and the beginning was the word in the beginning of what exactly? what we call recorded history, which goes back maybe 10,000 years and only exists in the recordings. Same rules over and over, 10,000 years, and there can't be any new rules because it is all pre-recorded. The world is contained in that word, the Saharan scabbard you hold in your hand. Um, that's it. If you have all recorded history, stored in one artifact, well, that's it. The world is shadows on the wall which flicker, flicker briefly over the recorder and return to silence. And here's uh, she who's got all these plots going. Oh, don't be silly and say you won't be emperor of Africa. After all, it's a game and we'll cheat you if we can. Now, isn't that fun? Uh, well, Hassan didn't think so. You have only to say it, you know the word. And uh, so, actually, in the end, uh, of course, the sands of present time are running out from under our feet. Where do we go from here? We are here to go. It still takes a pair to beat out old terrestrial death and roll out replicas all over the universe. All we need is the emerald. The last tape is they. The hymners make a brief dimmed-out appearance transformed into a dull couple from Champaign, Illinois. And Hassan is on the train again with his key pipe on his way to a teaching job in the Algut School. Uh, 
The recorder turns to an emerald seal slowly covered by dust and drifting sand. They have all spoken. The emerald was a tape, and the process was the word, the whole illusion of language. Now to consider in physiological terms the beginning of word and the function of language, there's a book on the list entitled The Origin of Consciousness and the Breakdown of the Bicameral Mind by Julian Jaynes. How many of you have read that? Ah, well, good, yes. Very interesting book. Uh, I'm not altogether convinced of his thesis, and the book, the, the end of the book sort of falls down completely. But anyway, he surmises that the first voices were what we would now call hallucinated voices. The chief, of, the chief or God King was able to evoke these voices, and this ability to make his subjects hear his voice was the reason for the awe in which he was held. If you could imagine uh, he's here and, and they're there, and they're hearing his voice right in their heads. He further surmises that the right or non-dominant brain hemisphere was the source of these voices. Now, someone carrying out a task, say, at some distance from the chief, needed this hallucinated voice to keep him on the job. The right brain hemisphere was the voice of God. So ruled by his right brain hemisphere, bicameral man was not conscious as we know consciousness, which is a byproduct of indecision and conflict. Bicameral man had neither conflicts nor responsibility. He was obeying the voice of God. To put it in Freudian terms, he had no ego. He was ruled by his superego and his id speaking through the right brain hemisphere. He had no need for what we call consciousness, which is ego. Homeric Greeks saw and heard the gods. Now the poet is, you see, we think of the poet like Homer is speaking in fanciful terms when uh, his heroes uh, talk with the gods. Not at all. He's speaking according to... Uh, James Lee is quite in factual terms, because people then were existing in a medium of hallucination, both uh, verbal, oral, and visual. Now, uh, why were the voices uh, believed and believed and obeyed? Authority of these voices derives from their very presence. The inner voice is inescapable. To hear is to obey. And he cites the case of a modern man on a beach, and, or, and a voice orders him to drown himself. And he would have done so, except that the lifeguard jumped in and pulled him out so he could tell the story. Um, and, of course, the voices of schizophrenics are definitely uh, in this category. Now, isn't this, this is very much the same thing what she says in the process. The first word was hello. The enforced recognition of another being, or at least another voice, and another purpose inside the human nervous system. Uh, James uh, cites a mass of evidence from patients with brain injuries and experiments with electrical brain stimulation. The right brain hemisphere is the source of creation, synthesis, and uh, the relation of objects in space. The simplest problem in geometry becomes extremely difficult if the right uh, brain hemisphere is damaged or destroyed. For example, that is, say, 0x0x0. Zero x, zero x, x, uh, zero. Well, obviously, the next uh, thing is x, but it would be very hard for anyone to see that if their right brain hemisphere was uh, destroyed. the left hand can. And stimulation of certain centers in the right hemisphere can produce oral hallucinations in normal subjects. Now, he doesn't go far enough. Wouldn't this lead us to infer that perhaps the voices were originally produced by some external stimulation, that an electromagnetic field or or uh, perhaps uh, even a virus was the original means by which the voices were internalized, and that these must have come from somewhere. Well, he doesn't go that far, actually. Now, the, the bicameral mind, according to uh, his thesis, 
uh, broke down in a period of great chaos and migrations, and this breakdown was the beginning of consciousness of the hallucinated internal space known as I. Now, his point is that, uh, well, the Homeric heroes had nothing, the, the, no such internal space. They didn't have this I. Uh, into morality, law, and divination, uh, narratization and responsibility, and deceit as well. You see, if you need, uh, he says that the, the rise of oracles is a very important step in the breakdown of the bicameral mind. If you need oracles, you don't got it. You don't have the, the voice of God in your own head. Well, any people then finally, uh, as this broke down, then the, the people who were hearing voices uh, became uh, sort of a nuisance. And, in fact, they were, uh, in many cases, driven out or even shut up into uh, concentration camps. Now, from this point on, uh, the dominant hemisphere is, from this point on, uneasily and insecurely dominant. Remember, the whole space we call I, our whole reality concept, which is a moving film of association, memories, is as much an illusion as the voice of God that ruled by Cameron Man. Both constructs are simply recordings. Uh, the whole screen you think of as reality may quite suddenly go blank. This is the way the world ends, not with a bang but a click. Uh, now, in evolutionary terms, we have seen the complete dominance of the non-dominant hemisphere and now the precarious dominance of the dominant hemisphere at the expense of, mental, uh, of great mental illness and crippling conflicts. And James has no solution, <coughs> and I think his, the uh, end of his book is quite disappointing. <coughs> As obviously some synthesis is necessary, perhaps the two brain hemispheres will ultimately just fuse into one, which eliminate uh, conflicts which are, I think, becoming more and more uh, crippling. There's a, a number of very interesting ideas in this book, and I recommend it. Um, he said, reading in the third millennium B.C. may have been a matter of hearing the form, that is, hallucinating the speech from looking at its picture symbols. And pictorial writing in general is a device to release information which the reader already has. Uh, he says, oh, of course, bicameral man had no internal space in which to be private and no uh, I to be private with. Um, and he speaks to the minds. It is possible that reading her hallucinating from the glyphs function for the minds as did hallucinogenic drugs for others. This is, is very interesting. And a book worth reading. Well, I'll stop here for some questions and discussion. Um, how many of you have read, uh, how many have read the book, uh, the Bicameral Mind book? Only one, yes. What do you think? Uh, that was my feeling, yes. Yeah. But he, he he begs the question as to where the voices came from in the first place. I mean, how they got into the um, <clears throat> the non-dominant brain hemisphere. But this is rather the whole thing is rather uh, very much a a, um, a pointed issue now because uh, these cult leaders like um, oh, Hubbard and Jones and so on, they become the voice of God to their followers. Yeah. Yes, indeed. They, but I, mean, I remember reading about, uh, Sidenon said that his voice, what was his name, Lynn Dietrich or whatever his name was, that seemed to drift out of the loudspeaker. It was just all around you. Maybe he had tape recorders um, playing back his voice. But, but uh, that... Apparently, is what happens that uh, they become the voice of God to their followers, which means that they have 
uh, as it were, invaded the non-dominant brain hemisphere. Hmm? That's right, yeah. yeah. Yes, exactly. Exactly, if they don't, um, if they don't conform. But it's amazing because uh, some of the uh, Dietrich followers, the Sinanon people, they believe to this day that the media put the snake in the mailbox to discredit Sinanon. I mean, how... How far can it go? Well, somewhat further when Joan ordered them all to commit suicide. Um, yeah. They do. They do. Very definitely. Um, well, let's see. Uh, further, any, some further questions? Yes. Uh, wouldn't the disease be an uh, example of a man with a masterful and uh, clever ego of a sort that we recognize in formerly uh, modern? You're talking about cult leaders? Well, I'm referring to James's idea that all the people there were asleep, caught up in the war of the gods. It seemed to me that, that part of you know, Odysseus's uh, uh, strength was that he, he was yeah. clever in his way. Yeah. Well, yes, that was. Uh, the point I was making that that anyone um, who is going to has the strength to sort of produce his voice in other people uh, and, and make them obey. Well, there are there always sort of dominant, strong personalities, whether they you know, be leaders in um, in any sort of a positive sense or just con men. But they had the power to convince, in other words. Any any cult leader must have the power to convince. Now, as you point out, he's he's convincing people often who are quite ignorant, that, and um, he wants to keep them that way. That's the way he likes to see them, is ignorant. Did you say earlier that they cultivate some non-dominant hemisphere and the control of the They've done lots of experiments with electric brain stimulation say, in stimulating <clears throat> certain areas in the uh, right brain hemisphere, and that will produce hallucinated voices in perfectly normal subjects. Earlier, you were talking about convincing cults. Did you say that cults, uh, leaders, tend to uh, take on the voice of like not that what is now becoming not dominant in the hemisphere? Yes. Mm -hmm. So is that to imply that, that we're still not very far away from uh, what used to be what's now not dominant in the hemisphere, that we're very close to still hearing voices? Well, yes, and lots of people do hear voices, and actually we all hear voices. Uh, we have, we have the mem voices of memory, and of course, uh, oral hallucinations are among the most common, and I think there are very few people that haven't had it at one time or another. Uh, the most common is to hear someone call your name. But, uh, so it's, uh, it's not an uncommon occurrence. You don't have, it doesn't isn't confined to uh, schizophrenia by any means. Well, I don't know. You see, what has happened is we had first a complete dominance, uh, according to his thesis. It's probably a simplification. Say the complete dominance of the non-dominant hemisphere. That's the guy's getting his orders from the voice of God, and that's it. <coughs> It doesn't have any conflict. Then uh, we have, as I say, the precarious dominance of the uh, dominant hemisphere, which is logic, linear thinking, et cetera, and all like that, which uh, frequently breaks down into mental illness and great uh, manifestations of uh, illogic, uh, such as we had in the uh, Nazi movement and so on and so forth. And uh, so the 
what we've had in the since the breakdown of what he calls the bicameral mind is a state of conflict, which we have now. And this conflict, as I say, often resulting in mental illness and all sorts of aberrations. And now we have a realization that um, that lateral, that lateral, that linear thinking is not the answer, and that uh, you know all the. Um, what? Well, this is this microphone doing anything here? Oh, I thought it was just. Uh, Yes. Well, as I say, first we had the uh, the rule of the uh, bicameral mind, that is the the non-dominant brain hemisphere. And when that broke down, we had a very uneasy dominance of the dominant hemisphere, which has existed to this day with um, many breakdowns and a great deal of conflict and illness. So. Um, and that, now the feeling that uh, linear thinking and logic is uh, just a, a very small part of the picture, and that has, of course, has resulted in, uh, uh, well, Eastern religions, uh, interest in Eastern religions, medita meditation, Buddhism, and uh, on the another level on in uh, uh, cults and all sorts of uh, programs for self improvement and. Uh, uh, who's the man that uh, uh, that's always talking about lateral thinking? Bono. Bono. Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So we have now a reversal, and presumably, if we're to make a forward step, there must be some kind of a synthesis. Although James doesn't uh, say anything about this, and apparently doesn't believe in such a synthesis, and is very negative towards. Um, um, those who are attempting to do uh, lateral thinking and to get away from uh, linear thinking. I mean, he seems to feel that there's no uh, no possibility of a synthesis. Excuse me, yeah. It's kind of a rising of uh, the person, uh, the individual's own uh, personality or ego uh, breaking away from the character. So it's getting back to the pulse, getting back to the yeah yes very much so very much so yes so there is a very definite swaying away from rationality at the present time but he doesn't he doesn't suggest any sort of synthesis of uh, well, the two brain hemispheres, to put it in uh, simplest terms. Yes. Yes. Yes, sir. Well, no, he is not. He is uh, pointing out, for example, that the. Um, the bicameral mind broke down in a period of great sociological change and chaos, not necessarily um, uh, physiological. But I don't think that there are any, uh, that I think that the, the such changes would involve uh, physiological changes. It's a question of what one is used to, how one is used to thinking. If one has been uh, used to. Uh, Bicameral thinking, that is, the hearing the voice of God. Uh, if you're used to that, you are uh, physiologically different from someone who is not. What does it do with a fellow like Socrates, who so would probably be pointed out as a great God of rationality in the West and start with the, um, the, 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 the whole sequence of linear thinking? Who was hearing voices? No. No, Socrates is way after uh, what he considers the breakdown of the bicameral mind. Uh, any any philosophy, see, they didn't need any philosophy if they've got the uh, they got the voice of God inside. So Socrates is way after that. Socrates, the philosophers, and in fact, uh, very much earlier uh, divination indicates that the bicameral mind had broken down. That's what he's talking about. 
the, the arising of what we call consciousness, which he says is something that these people didn't have at all. Uh, say the uh, Homericos, the early Homericos, did not have anything corresponding to I. Hmm? Except what? Well, uh, yeah, he, he points out the Odysseus is a later um, hero, that is, he's not one of the earliest, and that he began, yes, he pointed out exactly that Odysseus in the beginning of deceit is the breakdown of the bicameral mind. You've got a bicameral mind going, there isn't any deceit. Yeah, he points that out. Have you read the book? Well, yeah, well, he points that out very definitely, that Odysseus was uh, one of the signs that the, the deceitful hero, who has a very definite ego and a very tricky ego, is uh, one of the signs of the breakdown of the bicameral mind, one of many. The whole concept, of course, of responsibility, of morality, well, the whole of philosophy, really, indicates uh, the breakdown of the by Carol Mine and all, all, all um, rules of conduct. Uh, more questions? Well, it's a, it's a very, very important point, you see. Remember, this is very new, and that uh, now you can, um, by electronic means, uh, tune right into the uh, right brain uh, hemisphere. There's all sorts of things that can be done with, uh, with uh, tape recordings, as we saw at Watergate. So uh, this, is a, this is a new development. Is, um, the tape recorder, and one of the more important, probably one of the more important developments, one of the more important inventions, God's little toy, as Paul Bowles calls it. Exactly that. Um, yeah. A lot of evidence mounting, you know, for example, what's that, what's that new science, kind of science mounting? Omni. Omni. Right. You know, uh, dealing with, uh, for example, types of coline, uh, lithosome, you know, everything that's affecting your, uh, so to speak, uh, mechanical chemistry memorization right there, too, so it's tied right in. Right? Yes, certainly. Mm -hmm. uh, questions? The, uh, on the reading, in the reading list, uh, I'm going to go through talking about books that I haven't talked about uh, briefly now. These books, the uh, Le Vieux de la Montaigne and the Caliph Hakim by Betty Boutoul, about the only books on a very, uh, to my mind, a very important and unique figure, uh, the old man of the mountain, Hassan Saba, who uh, lived about 1,000 A.D. The old man of the mountain, master of the assassins. Operating from a mountain fortress in Alamut, where he trained his assassins, he terrorized the whole Muslim world. His long, bony finger could reach as far as Paris. Now, his uh, technique was that he would... No, he's going to have trouble from so and so, some caliph, some general, and then he would plant uh, one of his men, either in the uh, sometimes in the entourage or as a servant. There's one case of a general 
uh, who was about to uh, start a campaign against uh, Hassan Isaba's fort, Alamut. He wasn't paying taxes up there. He was living outside the law. And there were many expeditions made against Alamut. Well, uh, at this point, when the general was getting all ready to uh, launch this campaign, an old man who had worked in the garden for 10 years killed him with a scythe. He was one of uh, Hassan Isaba's um, assassins. There are many misconceptions of Hassan Isaba, the uh, hashish story, you know, that uh, he gave them hash and they felt themselves transported to a paradise which was full of uh, horries. And anyone who's taken hashish knows this is pretty absurd. And they said there were no women allowed in Alamut at all. And everything points to a very Spartan discipline. He had his own son beheaded for bringing wine into Alamut. But you see this system. You have a fortress which is surrounded by partisans. It wasn't, it wasn't by, only means the, by any means the only fortress. Uh, he was in uh, no effect position with regards to his opponents. That is, he could affect them. They couldn't affect him. And this is still a very viable tactic. But, of course, the no effect position would have to be ensured by concealment. Uh, they made a number of attempts, as I say, to take Alamo, but it didn't, wasn't taken until, um, oh God, about 200 years after the death of um, Hassan E. Saba. And his last words were supposed to have been, uh, nothing is true, everything is permitted. Now, this is usually taken as a license to commit any sort of atrocities. Everything is permitted. But remember that everything is permitted because nothing is true. That is permitted to someone who realizes that everything is illusion. Um, so uh, the, the Caliph Hakim is, uh, was also a member of the same sect, sect of the Ishmaelian sect, uh, but <clears throat> uh, he was a Caliph of... Uh, Cairo, and uh, was very tyrannical indeed, but he's the only tyrant ever to take absolutely no regard for his personal safety. He rode around on a donkey all through the streets of uh, Cairo, where he was very much uh, hated, but he was never uh, assassinated. He disappeared, finally. Um, the whole matter of uh, Hassan Isaba's method and uh, there was supposed to have been a large library at Alamo, uh, but there's no record of this. Uh, Brian Geisen has been there, and he said there couldn't have been more than 100 people at most resident in Alamo. It's because it's, it's just the top of a mountain. And they must have gotten their uh, supplies from surrounding villages, which must have been friendly. Um, some of these books, I think of recent or alleged books of, to come from Alamut have recently turned up in Bombay somewhere. So there's very little known about the, uh, the act, what actually went on there, what form of training the, um, the um, assassins received or how he could activate them at a distance, which apparently he could. Uh, it is true that he uh, was in, in um, Egypt at one point and that he uh, had come in contact, in contact with Hashish and that he, this formed some part of the training. But um, it certainly wasn't, it didn't uh, cause people to uh, be tricked into a, a fake paradise. That is a, just a misconception of uh, what was going on there. Well, uh, any questions? Have, have any of you read any of um, There is another book, I think, The Valley of the Assassins. There are a couple of other books about uh, Hassan Isaba and the other members of the so He was a member of the Ishmaelian uh, cult, remember, or sect, uh, which survives in the Alicon. 
who is supposedly traces his uh, descent to Hassani Saba. Now, this uh, this, this um, genealogy is very, very questionable. It was supported by the English, who wanted to uh, use him as a um, uh, sort of a puppet uh, ruler, and it uh, it has been questioned. And um, it was a dissident, a dissident uh, Muslim cult that had uh, I, I, the tenets of it are really quite uh, hard to pin down because Hasni Saba left no written record. I mean, had didn't write any uh, uh, sort of a test, um, um, you know, Bible or anything like that. There's uh, very little um, written. Have any of you read anything about uh, Hasni Saba at all? Yeah, there's not much, uh, not much known about him. And uh, mm, what? Mm. There's a couple of books: The Valley of the Assassins. Well, there was another book on secret societies, which I forget the name, uh, which uh, listed the assassins as one of the um, one of these secret societies. Yes. Hmm? Oh, yes. Yes. That is uh, Le Vieux de la Montaigne by Betty Boutou. Both of these books are unfortunately in French and have not been translated. The second, the second uh, book on the list is what I was just talking about. Uh, published by Gay Lamard in 1924. Um, and as I say, have not been translated. And the only others, others I know, there are about two um, that I, I forget the author and the name, but she certainly had the, it's the, certainly the best and most complete account. Although what her sources were, the, the Russians are the great, uh, the, the most um, uh, considerable scholars on this particular subject of Hassani Saba and the um, genealogy etc. The Muslims took it, uh, not the Muslims, excuse me, the Mongols took uh, Alamut in about 1200 and something. And then there was the rumor of this library, which uh, has never turned up. So it's pretty wide open for uh, research and also for inference since we don't know what the actual training was. Of the of the assassins received, so uh, it's uh, a good subject for fiction. Oh yes, yes, yeah. Hassan, uh, yes, Hassan Isaba is one of my. Uh, I've, I've been very interested in uh, uh, find out as much as I can about him and. Um, he was uh, apparently a pretty unique figure. 